سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يتع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وأحسن الحدي حدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار ثم أما بعد Indeed, all praises and thanks are due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We praise and we seek His help and we seek His assistance. We seek the refuge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from our own selves, from the evil that is in us and from the evil of our uh, consequences of our actions. Whomsoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides, no one can misguide Him. And whomsoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses to lead us straight, then no one will be able to guide Him after that. I bear witness that nothing has a right to be worshipped except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is alone without any partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam is his slave and his messenger. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says what means, O you who believe, O people of iman, of faith, fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way that he has a right to be feared and do not die unless you are Muslim. O mankind, revere your Lord who created you from a single soul and from that soul is mate and from both of them many men and women. So fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one from whom you demand your mutual rights and don't sever the ties of the wounds that bore you. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ever watchful over you. O you who believe, fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way that he has a right to be feared. Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and speak a word that is directed towards the truth. Allah will rectify your affairs for you and set them in order. And whoever has obeyed Allah and his messenger has already achieved a great success. As to what follows, then without a doubt, the most truthful speech is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Qur'an. And the best guidance is the guidance of Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam, his sunnah. And the worst of all matters are the newly invented matters into the religion. For every newly invented matter into the religion is an accursed and wretched innovation. <clears throat> every accursed and wretched innovation is astray. And everything that is astray will eventually lead the one doing this action to the fire. And may Allah protect us from the fire. <clears throat> Last week, we spoke about some of the rights of children in Islam. We spoke a little bit about that uh, last week. And I think that it's only right that we do what has to happen before children in Islam. Marriage. We have to have somewhat of a discussion about marriage. And just like the khutbah from last week, this topic in particular is a topic that no khutbah can do justice. This is something that you need a series of lectures to cover and reiterate it over time. Because everything goes back to marriage for us. This is the way we expand our families and our community. And this is the way that the Ummah spreads and enlarges. The institution of marriage is important. In fact, it's the most emphasized sunnah of the Mursaleen. 
It's the most emphasized sunnah of all of the messengers of Allah, alayhim salatu wa salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says about marriage, فَنْكِحُوا مَا تَوَبَ لَكُمْ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ مَثْلَى وَتُلَاتَ وَرُبَاعَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, and marry those who please you from the women, two, three, or four. And marry those who please you from the women, two, three, or four. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he goes on to say what means, and lawful for you, meaning in marriage, all others beyond these, provided that you seek them in marriage with gifts, your property, desiring chastity, and not unlawful sexual intercourse. SubhanAllah. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said to the youth, alayhi salatu wasalam, Ya ma'ashar al-shabaab, man istatu'a minkum al-ba'a, fali yatazawwaj. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, O oh, you, company of you, O oh, you young people, right? Because it's kind of assumed, uh, uh, presumed that the older people will already understand this, right? The young people are kind of running wild a little bit. And this was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam talking to the best people, the people in his time, the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum, and their children, right? Who are also from the Sahaba. Because the definition of a Sahaba or Sahabi is anyone who met the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, believed in him, accepted Islam, and died believing in him. Then this is what constitutes being a companion of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. So he said alayhi salatu wasalam, ya ma'ashar al-shabab, O you company of you. Man is aminkum al-ba'a, faliyatazawwaj. Whoever from amongst you is able, then let him marry. Whoever from amongst you is capable, who is able, then let him marry. And then he went on to say, فَإِنَّهُ أَغَطُّ لِلْبَصْرِ وَأَحْسَنُ لِلْفَرُجِ Because verily, it is something that protects your private parts. It's something that protects your private parts. And it helps you to lower your gaze. It helps you to lower your gaze and it helps to protect the private parts. SubhanAllah. So the purpose of marriage is what? To help you contain your nafs and to fulfill your desires in a lawful way. This is the purpose of marriage. Many people know how to get married. It's simple, right? At the very least, you can go down to the justice of the peace. And if you Muslim, you know, either you come to the masjid or you call one of your partners up saying, man, look, I need you to, you know, you know how it goes. It's easy to get married. But staying married, being married is the problem. That's the hard part. Everyone knows how to get married, but not everyone knows how to stay married. There's some things that needs to be understood. We know how to get married, but how do we stay married? First of all, we go back to what the Prophet says, what's the purpose of marriage? To help you lower your gaze and to protect your private parts. Right? So if we understand this, we understand from this, that marriage is a means of protecting society from lewdness. Right? It protects society from lewdness, inappropriate thoughts, inappropriate behavior. And it makes her a what? Like they used to say back in the day, like when the sheikh was young, make her an honorable woman. Unfortunately, women dishonor themselves now. They look at marriage as a crazy thing. Oh, I'm too young to get married. So what are you saying? You haven't had enough men between your legs yet? Because that's all it amounts to at the end of the day. I want to continue to date. I want to see other people. I don't want to settle down right now. What do you mean I want to settle down right now? To settle something down means it has to be sort of wild, right? Running wild and, and crazy, free, in order for you to have to settle it down, right? So this is something very important for us to understand. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, marry women who are loving and prolific. Marry women who are loving and prolific. For I shall be proud of the great number of my companions of my ummah, afwan, my ummah, as compared to the other nations on the day of resurrection. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, marry the woman who is 
loving and prolific. Loving and prolific. Al Wadud uh, Al Walud. The one who is loving, caring, and the one who can have a lot of children. Right? Because he wants his ummah to be the largest ummah on the uh, day of resurrection. Remember they used to say, be fruitful and multiply. Right? Now, naturally, we don't know. We can't look at a woman and tell if she's going to be prolific, per se. Only Allah knows best where he's going to you know, produce from, what he's going to produce from. But you can look at her family. You can look at her mother. You can look at her grandmother. Maybe even her father. How many children does her parents and grandparents have? They, 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 the aunts and uncles and cousins. Are they a, a family who is normally, you know, because in this sense, in this sense loving, caring, and prolific, they kind of go together. When a wife is loving and caring, she's always there to fulfill the needs of her husband and her family. Her family comes first. When she's at home, it's her parents, it's her grandparents, it's her siblings. And when she gets married, it's her husband, it's her family, right? Naturally, she's tending to their needs, to his needs, so it kind of makes her a little more susceptible to becoming pregnant again, right? They love one another, they care for one another, they're trying to reproduce, right? Or they're going through the motions. The things that happen when you love your wife and you become intimate with your wife or with your husband, right? Marry the woman who is loving and prolific. I want my ummah to be the greatest ummah in number. I'm going to be proud for my ummah on the day of resurrection. And some of the other virtues of marriage is that marriage involves keeping the existence of the human race, increasing the number of Muslims, causing annoyance to the disbelievers through the procreation of those striving in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well as those defending his religion. And that's very important because the more people you see, the more predominant you become and the more effect you start to have on the people. The people move differently when they see that they're outnumbered. Not that we want to be bullies or nothing like that, but we want to establish Islam. We expect that when we see a lot of Muslims, we want to see a lot of good. And all of this starts at home, right? We don't know what happens with our wives and children when they leave the home or when we leave the home. But we can try to rely on what we taught them and their faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and their obedience to him, right? That they're gonna do what's right in our presence and outside of our presence because although we don't see them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees everything. And this is how we should move and this is how we should think as men and women when we go about in society. Huh? But increasing the numbers, it causes a problem for the disbelievers. It causes a problem for the sinners because they realize that they look bad now. Now they can really see how they look in comparison to other people. Like I used to tell my children, you know, when, when you go to school, when we bring you to a new school, when we stop homeschooling and stuff like that, you know, when the people saw you coming and when they see other Muslims come, they get excited. They, now we got a child coming in with some sense. So they think that, well, they expect the child to have an effect on the other children a positive effect. So sometimes society looks at us and holds us to a higher standard than we hold ourselves. All of this starts at home. It starts with marriage. Marriage leads to maintaining chastity and keeping away from unlawful sexual intercourse that ruins human communities. And we all know what this means. When a person is married, and he's fulfilling his marital obligations. It helps him, it helps her. You can focus when you're not so frustrated. Right? And when you take care of that frustration in a lawful way, then this is a sort of This is a means of giving charity by being intimate with your wife. How merciful is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Marriage creates an atmosphere of tranquility mutual concord, security, and spiritual comfort between both the husbands and the wife. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا وَجَعْلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مُوَدَّةً وَرَحْمًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, and from his signs, is that he created for you spouses so that you can 
be tranquil. You can have tranquility, a sakina, peace. Live with them peacefully, tranquility. And he made between them love and mercy. He made love and mercy between the wives. So we understand love to an extent. Because in real, realistically speaking, because marriage is one of the things that we shouldn't delay, oftentimes you'll find the Muslims marrying and not really having that strong, deeply rooted love for your spouse. How's it possible? Sometimes, you know, love at first sight, all that kind of stuff. I mean, we understand that, especially for a young girl in particular who's never been married before. She's never experienced another man besides her, her father, her grandfather, her brothers, right? So this man is going to be everything to her. That's going to be her world, right? She's, he's going to be her heaven and her hell, right? So love is something that we understand. We love one another as Muslims. We have a legislated love for one another. We don't know one another personally in most cases, but we love one another for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the mercy has to come in. The mercy has to come in. We have to be merciful with one another. As spouses, as people in general, we have to deal with the people and treat the people the way that we want to be treated. And most importantly, this starts at home. You develop all of these characteristics at home. This is the training ground. Huh? The first school of learning for that child is his mother's lap. That's his first school. And if this is a good, if he's coming from a good family with a good bond between the mother and father, he's gonna benefit from that. He's gonna learn from that. And he's gonna deal with people the way that he saw his parents deal with one another. It's going to have a lasting effect on him. Even if they have differences. Because of the love and mercy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made between them. They're going to deal with this issue in a way that the people are not affected by. If they have things that they need to discuss. They're going to discuss it between themselves and not in front of the children. The man is not going to go to work. And the mother is going to be yelling and screaming around the house talking to herself. And talking bad about the hug, oh, this, this. and the children are just listening and sucking all of that stuff in, right? Or if they argue over the phone, they're home with the mother, they only hear her side of this argument. They don't hear his defense or even hear him being quiet, remembering Allah, remembering Allah. That's not funny. They don't hear that. All they see is their mother's aggression and anger because she wasn't able to control herself when she got angry. Where was the love and mercy? Where was the love and mercy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed in you? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and from his signs is that he created for you spouses in order for you to go to for sakina, or sakina, tranquility. And he placed between you love and mercy. Also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, uh, after this, we look at marriage as a means of protecting the society from immorality. Protecting the society, because the people need to see healthy marriages. Healthy marriages. We're not talking about that stuff that go on in reality TV shows, uh, housewives, and basketball wives, and hip-hop wives, and all that. No, we're talking about real life marriages where you see a mother, you see a father, you know, teaching their children and teaching the neighbor's children and creating an environment where children, you know that when children come around, they're going to behave a certain way. There used to be a time where we didn't just fear our parents, we feared our neighbors. We feared the parents of our neighbors. We feared the people around the corner because we didn't want something to get back to our mother and father. We feared our uncles, our aunts, our grandparents. Now the children don't respect anyone. Anyone. Why? Because they wasn't taught that. They weren't being taught that at home. They didn't see love and mercy being exhibited between the mother and father. 
They didn't see the mother and father having a united front even when they disagree. It all starts at home. How you deal with one another when you have issues. Huh? Realistically speaking, there are so many other virtues of lawful, honorable marriage. And we can, like I said in the beginning, this can take uh, courses, you know, classes, lectures, a series of lectures, repeatedly. And inshallah, we'll do that. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, treat the women kindly, for verily they are like captives in your houses. Treat them kindly. Treat them kindly. Think about this. For all of us who have daughters, Imagine your little girl that you raised, your biological daughter, that you raised from birth. You watched her come out of her mother. You cut the umbilical cord. You cleaned her mouth. You put that date on the roof of her mouth. You held her. You looked into her eyes. You love this girl. And you're going to protect her with everything, that every moral fiber that you have inside of you. So you raise her up, teaching her values and morality, teaching her decency. And you don't let anything or anyone affect her or harm her. Now it's time for her to get married. And after you looked at a couple of prospects and people came and you made this decision after making istikhara, which we all should be doing, making istikhara, not just marrying people, asking Allah for guidance first, and being pleased with Allah's decree and the signs. A lot of us, we, you know, we kind of, but that's another issue. We'll talk about that later, istikhara. But you take this girl, and at this point, you're handing her off to this man who you expect, you believe, is going to pick up where you left off. He's going to take her and he's going to carry the baton. You're going to pass it off to him. Right? So now he's going to be in her care, under her protection, after the protection of Allah. You expect certain things from him. How can you turn around and not be that way with your wife? How can you turn around and not be that way with your wife? What type of woman wants to be abused, who likes being abused, yet you know your son is abusing his wife, you know your brother is abusing his wife, and you find a way to blame her, Well, you don't challenge that. All of this stuff starts at home. It all starts with marriage. Everyone knows how to get married. Not many people know how to maintain this relationship, how to stay married. Marriage is by far the greatest contract that we have in Islam, and, it's, and, and marriage is indeed a contractual agreement between two people. That's why it's written down and you take two witnesses. It's the greatest contract because it makes the private parts permissible. And it brings two people together that were never together before. It makes them lawful for one another and it brings together two families and communities and maybe even worlds, depending on where they come from. The institution of marriage is a serious matter and we should be mindful of it and take into consideration the serious nature of it and approach it that way and deal with one another in a way that Allah intended for us to deal with one another. And from his signs is that he created for you spouses from amongst yourselves. And he made between you love and mercy. Marriage is a great institution. When we have great institutions, we have to have structure, right? No matter what we do. We're not going to start a business with a partner who don't have some type of plan some type of things that you put in place in order to make sure that the partnership works the way that it's supposed to work. 
right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's compensation, whether it's payouts, whatever the case may be. You want to make sure that it's a, a well fine tuned, well oiled machine. Marriage is like that, right? You have rights. The man has rights, the woman has rights. Everything in creation has rights, and we're supposed to give everyone its rights. Even the body, your body has the right over you that you give it proper rest, exercise, and feed it the right things, all right? Protect it. Most importantly, the head. The prophet says on the line, they were trying to protect your head, all right? That's why it's not permissible for us to hit each other in the face. But not just the physical head, but what you see and what you hear, what goes into your eyes and ears because it goes right to the brain. Literally and figuratively, right? The eyes is right in front of the brain. The ears are right on the outside of the brain. And the brain talks to the body, talks to the heart. And there's a balance between the heart and the mind, right? Sometimes you have to follow your heart. Your heart is going to take you certain places. But sometimes your mind has to step in and say, no, I don't think that's a good idea. Your heart may be telling you one thing, but your mind has to come and say, no, I don't think that's the right thing. And sometimes you may have some crazy thoughts to emanate from somewhere, but then you have to reach inside and look in your heart and say, in my heart, I know that this isn't right. It's not right. My heart is telling me that it's wrong. So you follow your first mind, which is the heart, that's letting you know that this is wrong and it's something that I shouldn't do. The woman in marriage, in Islam, she has the right to be provided for. The man should provide for his wife. He should feed her. He should clothe her. And he should shelter her. He shouldn't abuse her. He should teach her. He should protect her. Right? Even if she's self-sufficient, this shouldn't make him any less of a man. He should be responsible for her and help her manage her affairs and she should be willing, right? He's her leader, he's her Amir. So she should look at him and respect him as such, and he should be that way in all aspects. The man has a right to be obeyed in everything that is right. There's no obedience to a created thing when it entails disobedience to the creator. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said about the obedience of the wife to her husband that if she was to pray her five daily prayers and fast her month, meaning the month of Ramadan, and to guard her chastity and her modesty and obey her husband, then she can enter Jannah through any of the eight doors she desires, the eight gates or doors she desires. And there's a, a lot of discussion about the rights of the husband and the, and the woman's, the, the, the wife's obligation to fulfill those rights and obligations. The husband should be one who leads by example, and he shouldn't be tyrannical in his rule. And she should accept that, and they should work together, fulfilling these rights and helping one another. And when problems arise, there should be an outlet, a vehicle, somewhere that he can go, somewhere that she can go, so that these issues can be addressed. No woman should feel like she can't come to the administration and talk to the administration about what's going on if it's getting to a point where they can't talk to one another. If the man is abusing her, or even if the woman is abusing him, the man who allows this woman to run around free, with no hijab, doing whatever she wants to do, coming and going as she pleases, talking to whoever she wants to talk to, all on social media, then this man is a dayu. Huh? He's like a guy who just basically doesn't care. Almost like a... It's hard to even translate this word. Someone who just lets his women just run free. It's almost like he doesn't care. It's words that I could use, I don't want to use. But imagine not caring about a woman and just letting her come and go as she pleases. They you. Right? This is who he is. This is how he is. 
So first and foremost, the obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The desire to fulfill the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and maintain what he ordered you to maintain, like we mentioned, kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'oolun an ra'iyyati. All of you are like shepherds, and all of you have a flock, and all of you are responsible for your flock. So the woman should be able to come, the man should be able to come, and we should have administrators, people in positions, of, in, in administrative positions, who are non-biased people, who are not going to lead one way or another, a lean one way or another. Islam is a religion of justice. So when we hear these arguments, we have to wear, I don't care if I know you, I don't care if I know her, I don't care if my son, my daughter, it doesn't matter. They're all human beings. I know a good brother, I know a good sister, but that don't mean they're good for one another. Compatibility is a major issue. So when she comes to me, telling me about somebody that I like, oh, he comes to the masjid, he prays, okay? But what happens when he goes home? You don't know this man like that. You don't know him like that. You don't know what type of man he is when he enters his home. So you have to take into consideration what she's saying. Nor can you be one who, every time a woman comes and complains, all of a sudden you want to blame the men. Male bashing is a, is a major thing in the world in general, especially in the Muslim community. All oh, these men, this, all oh, these men, man don't do this, woman on welfare, he want another wife, all that kind of stuff. All situations are unique. And like I said, inshallah, we're going to try to discuss this in more detail in a series dealing with marriage. So may Allah facilitate this for us. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in ba'akum as-salam.